Hey everybody, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold with our weekly lecture series. This lecture is going to be on the 2013 World Chess Championship match between Carlsen and Anand. And this was the match that made Carlsen the world champion for the first time. Uh, Anand was the reigning champion. And they played in Chennai in India, which is um, where Vichy lives. And uh, in 2011, I was at Vichy's home in Chennai uh, having lunch or dinner, I forgot, some, some meal uh, with his family. I've known Vichy since 1986, and we're like that, son. Um, anyway, I was in Chennai for the World Junior Championship. I was coaching Ray Robson, and I got very sick at the end, but at the very end, so I, I lasted a long time. Uh, so what happened was in 2011, uh, I was at the Tall Memorial in November in Moscow, and it was a very strong tournament. Okay, maybe one of the five strongest of all time. I mean, like Carlson was like the worst player. I mean, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding too much. Uh, the person who came in clear last was Nakamura. So that was a strong tournament. He didn't win any games. Uh, Carlson had two wins and seven draws, and he tied for first. And he won his last game. So tough tournament. Um, but anyway, the point of the story is Gelfand and Anand were at that tournament in Moscow in November 2011, and they signed the contracts right as the tournament ended to play the World Chess Championship in 2012, which they did. And as you all know, except for one thing, uh, Anand and Gelfam played to a 6-6 draw. Then they had a rapid playoff, which Anand won. So in 2012, Anand retained his title. And also in 2012, I think, unless it was 2013, it was 2013, terrible. 2013, uh, they had a candidates tournament and what I remember about the tournament was Kramnik and Carlson were tied for first going into the last round. And uh, Kramnik had black against Ivanchuk, and Carlson had white against Fiddler. So now the problem with Ivanchuk is he went sort of crazy that tournament. Half the time Ivanchuk's crazy and half the time he's not. This tournament he was crazy. And by crazy, he lost five games on time. Ivanchuk did. So I don't, I don't know what was going on. Anyway, so Carlson's playing Fiddler. Carlson's white. Carlson ends up losing. So he's choking on his own rage because now he has to wait two more years to play a world championship match when he was obviously the favorite, being the highest rated player in the world. And to his... Uh, delight, uh, Ivanchuk crushed Kramnik in the last round. One of Ivanchuk's only wins. And they tied for first. Carlson wins on tie breaks. Carlson plays Anand for this world championship that we're discussing this lecture. And I know some things because I know the players. I know Magnus is dead, Hendrik. And when the tournament was given to India. Carlson and his dad thought, well, we're not going to play in India because, you know, they, they thought India was terrible, which is what I still think. But, and my observations about India are based on the tournament I went to in 2011, the World Junior, which was at one of the worst hotels. And this hotel has very funny reviews on the Internet. Like, never, ever stay here, worst hotel in the world, etc. Et That's the hotel I stayed at in Chennai. Now, conversely, they played at the Hyatt Regency Chennai, which is a five-star hotel. And Carlson's dad told me that when they went to India to inspect the hotel and playing area, their intention was to not go. They were going to look at the place and say, this is unacceptable and we have to find another venue. However, when Carlson got to India before the match, I mean, like months before, he was treated like 
like they liked him more than Anand in India. He was like, people were like, yay, Carlson, what a, what a chess player. And the hotel was fantastic. The playing hall was fantastic. And they were like, okay, we'll play here. And this match was very strange because Anand didn't win any games, which is strange. And it was a 12 game match, but they only played 10 games. And after 10 games, Anand uh, was down six and a half, three and a half. So that's six and a half wins the match if it's a 12 game match. And so they didn't play games 11 and 12 because the match was already over. <clears throat> and Carlson won three games and they were all suspicious. And those are the games we're going to look at uh, in this lecture are the three decisive games. And uh, I think in 2014, unless I'm wrong, and if I'm wrong, people on YouTube are going to say, well, you're, you're wrong. How can you be so wrong? I think in 2014, they played again. And Carlson won again and so forth. Uh, and Carlson has defended his title every time, although uh, he tied with Karyakin and beat him in tie breaks. And he tied with Caruana and beat him in tie breaks. So Carlson's had some tough world championship matches where after 12 games, it was tied at six. And this one wasn't one of those. And that was because of three blunders. Um, this match could have gone either way, but unfortunately, Anand was blundering at the, end of the, at the end of some games. So the Wikipedia article tells you everything you want to know about the tournament. And for reasons I don't understand, uh, they talk a lot about the candidates tournament that I was talking about. Um, they talk about where it was and who played and what the scores were. Um, which is a lead up to the world championship. Whoever won this candidates, and you can see on your screen, Svidler, Grishuk, Ivanchuk, Carlson, Aronian, Kramnik, Rajabov, and Gelfand. Whoever won that tournament got to play a non for the world championship. Okay. And here's the final cross table where Carlson and Kramnik tied for first. And Kramnik lost his only game in the, in the last round. And Ivanchuk, who finished near the bottom of, this, of the cross table, he actually beat Carlson and Kramnik. It was a double round robin, um, and Rajibov came in last, and so forth. So Carlson went on tie breaks. I don't know what the tie breaks were. Um, whatever the tie breaks are. Typically... It has to do with you having a better score against the people who scored the most. So I don't know if that's the case. Um, head to head was tied. Oh, okay. It says wins, which also means losses. If you have the most wins and you tie with somebody, that means you had the most losses. And they rewarded that in this event. Carlson had five wins and Kramnik had four wins. The first tie break was head to head and they split one, one with each other. Then they went to who had the most wins. Those were the tie breaks. You could argue whether that's, you know, good tie breaks. And you have all the results from the candidates, and it leads up to the World Championship match, which was played in November of 2013 in Chennai. Then they have all prize fund and all that, the seconds and all that stuff. And I know that Peter Hein Nielsen, who's been uh, Carlson's coach for... 12 years or more, maybe more. He used to be a nonce coach. So there you go. Truth hurts. Okay, so enough of the preamble. Let's look at the games, the, the, the ones that matter. Okay, and I didn't know this. I mean, I did know it, but I forgot. Um, I knew at the time because I was following this match live. And not only did I follow it live, the last game started at like, 3.30 in the morning, uh, St. Louis time. And I did live commentary for people who showed up in St. Louis with Ronan Harz V on the last game. We started our commentary at 3 a.m. And about 20 people showed up at the chess club at 3 a.m. Because this was a big deal. I mean, Anand had been five-time world champion. Everybody knew Carlson would eventually become world champion. But would this be his time? And... 
what I didn't know until I was looking at the games today was Carlson actually won two games with black and he won one game with white. And these games all had a blunder at the end of the game. So this match could have gone either way, but a non blundered instead of Carlson. So truth hurts, but the games were fascinating. Even the draws. Okay. This is game uh, five. I think Carlson won games five, six, and nine. No. I think he won games... Well, wait a minute. He won two with black. Oh, they might have switched the white and black. So I think I'm right. I think it was five, six, and nine. Okay. Because a lot of times in a world championship match, instead of going white, black, white, black, white, black forever, they do white, black the first six games, then they switch. And then the person who should get white gets black so that the other guy gets white more often at the end as opposed to the beginning. Okay, so uh, Carlson and Anand, they played uh, semi-Slav, Slav kind of position. Bishop b4 check, knight c3. And much more interesting, maybe too interesting, is bishop to d2 and queen takes d4. There's a lot of games that go that way. Knight c3 is relatively unpopular, but I've seen it. But bishop d2 is more common. But knight c3 doesn't sacrifice a pawn. So. Okay, c5, that's the main move. I actually know this line, even though I don't play either side of it. I've seen it several times. And I think it's more common to take the knight on c3. But Anand played bishop a5, maintaining the pin. Knight f3. They're developing their pieces. They must be the two best players in the world. Bishop e3, knight c6. Queen d3 is an unusual move. It stops knight e4 and protects the knight on c3. So I'm guessing somewhere around here, probably their preparation ended and they started playing chess. Takes, knight takes, knight g4, tacking the bishop. And usually in chess, if black can play knight g4, attacking a bishop on e3, it's usually a good move. And it happens a lot in the Sicilian. This is not a Sicilian, but it still happened. Okay, and he long castled, very aggressive move. Black has the two bishops. White takes with the pawn. White bolsters his center, and he opens up the F file. And it looks like, even though Black has the two bishops, the bishop on C8 isn't very good. Bishop C7, and White ruins Black's pawn structure. So both pawn structures are ruined. You can argue Black has the two bishops, but again, bishop on C8, not very good. King e7, you don't want to castle in the end game. You want your king to defend all these critical squares. Bishop d7, defending the pawn. And basically, the engine says everything is about equal the whole game. It says white's a little bit better, maybe black's a little bit better, but not, nothing serious. And basically equal. And it's not clear to me who was pressing, but I guess... Carlson was pressing because he's white. Okay, and this was a very nice tactic by Anand. Anand threatens the pawn on e3, and after c5, he plays f5, and this forces trades into a drawn position because you can't move the knight because bishop takes c5. So you have to take the bishop, and then he didn't want Anand to straighten out his pawns by playing bishop e4, a, b. White, white has no advantage here at all. So he played b7 to keep black's pawns, you know, separate. Still, the engine says it's equal. Just, just, just an equal endgame. Nobody's really better here. So it looked like it was going to be another draw, because all the games had been drawn previously, and this was looking like a draw, and the engine was saying it's a draw, Material's completely equal. It's not clear who's playing for a win. Just seems like a random position. And Edgen still says it's a draw. It says everything's equal. 
King c3 attacks the rook on d4, so we don't have time to take on b3. Black's pieces are all very nice, so should just be a draw. Okay, and a non-played a4, which is excellent. And they, they traded pawns. So now it's rook bishop and four against rook bishop and four. Carlson wins a pawn, but it's of no consequence. Rook d1. You can't play bishop c2 because of rook c1 pinning the bishop. You can't play bishop a2 because that hangs the bishop. If you play king here, I can check and then repeat or take here. So he played e5 check so his bishop could get out. And then bishop h7. And in this position, a non-played rook c1 check, which is a mistake, but he's still drawing. The, the most drawing move is rook a1. And we're threatening this pawn, and you can't save it. If you play king b2, I can check you on a2. And black's going to have two pass pawns on the queen side. And the most important variation is this one. And black plays rook takes a3, pinning the bishop. And we have a drawn rook and pawn endgame. That's why rook a1 first was better, because he has rook takes a3 after bishop g8 check. But he played rook c1 check, which also draws, but now white's better. Check, check, takes, 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 takes. Rook takes h4. So obviously, white's better. White's two pawns up. But the engine still says it's a draw, because white's pawns are so weak. In this position, Anand made a mistake. Um, he should have played the move rook, rook to e2. And after rook e2, the engine says this position should be a draw. And instead he played king e6, which I think makes more sense. Like if you're a human, because you want to move your king up in the ending, the rook is already well placed on the seventh rank, so you want the king to take this pawn. And unfortunately... Uh, king e6 is the, is the losing move. And obviously, the players are exhausted because this is late in the game. So they've been playing for several hours. Now, since this is a World Championship match lecture, I'd like to talk about a little history. When World Championships were played before, let's say, 1980. Although, actually, let's say before 1988. because I think it's before 88. Uh, World Championship games were adjourned, which a lot of people don't know what that means now, but th the greatest players of all time who played chess between like 1900 and 1988, if there was a World Championship match, they would play four or five hours, they would play 40 moves, 45 moves, then the game would be adjourned and they would play it off the next day and the players and their analysts would analyze the game in the interim. And... That was common practice for games to be adjourned. They didn't want games to go seven, eight, nine hours. Okay. And in those instances, you'll see excellent endgame play because the endgames were analyzed by all the grandmasters before the resumption. Nowadays, games go six, seven, eight hours. There's no adjournments. So you're exhausted and you have to play these complex endgames. Okay. So a non-play king e6, which is bad, and Carlson correctly ignored his e-pawn and pushed his a-pawn, and a4 is the winning move. So rook e2 would have held the draw with correct play, and king e6, a4 is, is losing. And the reason is, if you play a4 now and try to play the same way that Carlson did, the black king is much closer to the pawn. So we're not so worried about this pawn. Our king can stop it, and white has two rook pawns, very difficult to win. So with the two rook pawns, you're not going to win because the black king is very close to one of them, and I have a pawn left myself. Like if I play king b5, I'm not, not even worse. Position's fine. Okay, but by playing king e6, which was a mistake, uh, his king is far away from the a pawn, so Carlson started pushing it. Now, as many of you know, and by many of you know, I mean very few of you know, one of the knocks against Anand in his career when he was in his teens and 20s and 30s 
was he was a bad endgame player. And when I say bad, I mean not as good as his middle game and opening. And what's funny is, in this match, when he's already in his 40s, and he's not considered a bad endgame player anymore, he lost two drawn endgames. And they were both Rick and Pawn endgames. So that's unfortunate. Okay, so A4, A5, and the engine says White's winning now. Black tries to get back, but he can't. And obviously, it would have made more sense instead of playing king here, king here, and then running back to take the pawn with the rook, and then the king is very close to the A pawn. Okay, so Carlson played rook H7, A6, A7, and Carlson has two pass pawns, one for each of you. H4, and there's nothing a non can do because this king can't get back and stop the pawn. The king can go to b6, but it can't go to b7. So white just pushes the pawn and keeps pushing the pawn. H, h5, h6, h7, h8. And the rook can't go behind the pawn because I queen. And this king can't stop this pawn. And if it did, white would play king takes pawn and win. So after h4, Vichy resigned. And that was the first game that Vichy lost in the match. And basically, he misplayed the rook and pawn ending, which should have been a draw. Very long game, although not the longest game he lost, which is actually coming up next. Okay, so they have lots of draws. It's a world championship match, so it's important to draw every game. Okay, then the next game... Uh, that Anand lost, he had the white pieces. Okay, and after the match, Anand said he should have played d4 with white. e4 was a mistake. I don't know what that means, but I guess he didn't get opening advantages with e4 against Carlson. Okay, so they played the, you know, anti-Berlin with d3. This is all theory. I think I said theory, and Siri thought I said Siri. <laughs> it thinks I have a lisp. I don't know. Okay, so Bishop A4. And this is just standard Rui Lopez. N not very exciting. Sort of a boring Rui Lopez. So both players are happy. Carlson wants to draw with black and win with white but he accidentally won a couple games with black. Then knight b8, very similar to the Briar variation invented by uh, Ice Cream Company. So the knight wants to go to d7 and protect the knight, and black wants to play c6, d5. Um, if you're watching on YouTube later, th that was a joke, the, the, the Ice Cream Company. Okay, so h3, knight d7, and you can see it's not very exciting. Knight h2, he wants to play knight g4 and queen f3. And they're just maneuvering their pieces. White wants to play knife f5 or knight d5, which, whichever is first. Nothing's happening. It's just equal position. White's trying to get an initiative on the king's side, but we're just trading pieces. Okay, so Anand thought he would have a better endgame here because his knight has access to these squares. And unfortunately, you can't play the move that you want to play, knight d5, because you're losing on f2. Queen takes f2 check. So he played queen g4, and he thought his knight will be better than the bishop eventually, but there was no eventually, because he just took the knight. And taking with the rook is impossible, because th this rook on a1 wouldn't be defended. So he has to take with the pawn. And this is just equal. Uh, I think the engine says black is better, like 0 .002 or something. So, Okay, so both sides are, are probably playing for a win, but it should be a draw. And in this position, the engine says d5 is all zeros. Nobody can ever win. But Anand didn't want to close it up yet. And they got to this drawn queen and rook endgame, 
where black's playing for a win because white has doubled isolated pawns, but black has two isolated pawn, two weak pawns also. So there's not really much for either side to do. Carl, Anand is just waiting. And finally, Anand plays queen g3, and he thinks the queen of pawn ending is drawn because it is. Takes, and then black can't play rook takes rook because queen takes queen. So black, if black moves the queen to like e8, then the, the end game should be a draw. So he traded queens. And now black has to play rook b7 to save his b pawn. And this should just be a draw, even though white's down a pawn. And Anand played perfectly until he didn't. Truth hurts. Never play f6. Rook d6 is like, haha, you can't move your king up. So he played f6 to move his king to f7. h5 was an excellent move. Black's pawns are all shattered, according to the Rolling Stones. And it's just, a, it's just a drawn position. The engine just says it's all zeros. And still drawn, everything's drawn. King e3, rook c4, f4. And basically for 99% of this game, the engine said it was about equal and it liked the way the players were playing. And in this position, Anand made the losing move. Now, first of all, you have to understand what black wants to do here. Black wants to play h3, and then after takes, he wants to queen his f pawn. And he's got his king hooked up with it too. So white needs to do something which activates his rook and threatens these pawns and threatens to check the king away. And unfortunately, he couldn't check the king away because he blundered here. He needs to play something like rook c6. So not only is he threatening a pawn, but he can check the black king where if it goes to f2, it's blocking the f pawn. And that's what you want. You want the black king in front of the f pawn, then white's gonna push his pawns. And the engine says it's a draw. But Anand blundered, he played rook a4. So, I mean, basically he made one mistake last game, and this game he made one mistake, rook a4. Now, now the engine says black is winning. It's the first time in the game I didn't say it was about equal. So late in the rook and pawn ending, Vichy makes another mistake, h3. You can't play f3 now, because never play f3, because it hangs the rook. So the rook has to move. And now black has a very easy winning plan. Of course, if white could play rook check somewhere and the king runs away, black's not winning. If the king goes in front of the pawn, it's hard for black to get his king out. Black's king is in a box. The rook is stopping this. You could play king f1, pawn f2, and then your king's trapped. And white's pushing their pawns. But here, you can't do that. Black's, black's pushing the pawn now. So that was unfortunate. Anon played c4, trying to get his pawn going, but that doesn't work. And now he played rook to a8, hoping for queen, and then rook f8 check wins the queen. But Carlson didn't fall for that. Carlson played rook g1, and now Anand resigned, because if you check, I go here, and I just run away with my king, and eventually I'm gonna queen. And black's gonna be a rook up. So everything was fine for Anand until this position, rook a4 losing, then he didn't fight very hard here. Uh, I think white should try to play uh, rook to the back rank and try to get back here. The engine says black is still winning, but I think that's a better chance than just letting black queen. That, that just seems wrong. And I think here, if I had the white pieces, uh, I, I would play rook a1. Since I'm not sure how to beat rook a1, let's see, how do I beat rook a1? I mean, because rook a8, rook g1 was an easy win. 
Uh, it looks like rookie six, rookie one wins instantly. I guess that's why Anand didn't do this. Rookie six, king g2, rookie one. And the truth hurts. Yeah, you could see that white's rook would be much better where it could check from the back. And Anand wasted several moves before he played rook a8. And when he played rook a8, it was too late. Yeah, this is, this is, okay, that's why he didn't do this. This is over. And then finally he played rook a8, and then the game was over. So he needed to play his rook not on a4, a3, and he needed to put his rook, you know, back here so he could check and get behind the pawn. And this was the losing move. So now Anand is down two points, and they're about to play game nine because that's the last game we're looking at is game nine. And Anand needs to win this game. Then after nine games, he'll be down one point and there's three games left. So not so bad, better than it was. And this game basically decided the match. Um, and it features, again, a very big blunder from Anand. This was his worst blunder of the match. And again... The engine says the game is about equal, maybe a non's a little better, and then just a blunder. And this, in my opinion, was the most exciting game to watch live, because I remember watching this with friends at, you know, two, three, four in the morning, you know, on the internet, watching it live, and even though we were middle of the night, it was exciting to see a non play Carlson. Okay, so they played a Nimzo Indian. Anand has white, f3, never play f3, and this is one of the main lines of this opening. Anand has white in this position often. c4 is unusual. I don't think Anand's had white in this position exactly. And Anand, knowing that he's down two points in the match, has to play super aggressively. White has the two bishops. And white has a better center. And Carlson decides to win on the queen side. So we see a very exciting game where Carlson's playing on the queen side and Anand's playing on the center and king side. The only person not excited is not a person, it's the engine. The engine's like, eh, it's about equal. But if you're a human, it's very exciting. Rook a2. a2 is a typical square when you play a3 in the Nimzo because your rook wants to come over to the second rank and prepare to push these pawns. And Carlson plays on the queen side, and Anon plays on the king side. Very exciting. Now Anon plays in the center. Black gets rid of the two bishops. Plays rook a6. The reason is the rook is defending on a6, and if black wants to play b4, eventually, which he does, then takes and the rook's not defended on, on a8. So on a6, the rook is defended. So we can get in b4 more easily. And we defend the king's side over here when white pushes everything. Okay, e5, knight c7, f4, here comes Anand. And when I was watching the game live, I remember thinking Anand's just going to crush Carlson on the king's side. There's no way black can defend this. And the engine says, eh, it's about equal. Okay, b4. So Anand's, uh, Carlson's crashing through on the queen side, but getting checkmated is worse. So trade everything, f5. Anand's really crushing on the king side. And b3. And I was thinking, this bishop's no good, this knight's no good, that pawn is stopped, and here comes white. So during the game... I remember thinking Anand's going to win. Queen f4, knight c7, f6, always play f6, g6, queen h4. This is looking pretty scary. Queen g7's mate, but the knight can go to e6 or e8. Unfortunately, on e6, for Carlson, we, we can take that knight. So if you play knight e6 and I play queen h6, I have a very simple plan. Bishop h3, bishop takes knight, and mate. So Carlson had to play knight e8, which trapped his rook. But he's stopping queen g7 mate. And I'm like, this has to be winning for white. 
White has this attack. Black's Rook is trapped. Black's King is trapped. The Knight can't move off of E8 because it's defending me. And the Bishop is behind all these pawns. The Bishop can't get out. And this pawn's not dangerous because I'm stopping it. So during the game, I was like, Anand's going to win. That's what I was thinking. Okay, Queen H6. B2, getting some counterplay. And Rook F4, an amazing move. And it's very difficult for white to break through on the king side. And so Anand decides, I'm going to play Rook F4, Rook H4, Queen H7 mate. And there's no defense to that. And I don't care if my opponent queens, because I'm going to checkmate them. So what do I care? And here the players are in time trouble also. And the engine actually says Rook F4 is fine. Okay, and black queened. So now white has to get out of check. If white wasn't in check, rook h4 just wins. Forced mate. And uh, unfortunately, Anam made like a triple question mark move here. Now, anybody who's my student knows what white should play here. You should always play it. And Anam blundered. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, but if he plays bishop f1, which is the correct move, threatening rook h4 and queen h7 mate, the engine says this is equal, and it gives all kinds of crazy lines. Um, and it says, like, eventually it's equal. And one of the things that black does is black can sacrifice on f6 at the right moment and then eventually play g5 and defend h7. That's, that's one, of, one of the key ideas. And in this position, black has to be careful, and it says he can still draw. So let me see what the... I think the right move is bishop g4. Stopping rook h4. But now I actually don't remember. I analyzed this, but it's too complicated. And it's possible if... Oh, I, I know what he's supposed to do. Now I remember. Uh, he's, he's supposed to play queen d1, rook h4, queen h5. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Okay, and the idea is if you take and take with unstoppable mate, it's not unstoppable. Bishop f5. And black's up a piece, and it's hard for, you know, black to play bishop g6. And, now, it's not clear that black's winning up a piece because black's pieces can't move. But it's not clear what white does either. So black will play like queen a5, take this pawn, take this pawn, try to queen. And if white defends that, white's attack is over, and eventually the knight can move. White has to keep the queen on h6. And I think the engine said this was a draw, but I don't know why. Um, something like g6, bishop g6, rook g5. It was something like this, and then... White plays h4, h5. And somehow, I think the engine said this was equal. Anyway, bishop f1, and black has to play queen d1 to h5, and I'm sure he would have. Uh, instead, a non-blundered with knight f1. Double question mark. Always play bishop f1, and the game only lasted one more move from here. So let's see if our, if our live uh, viewers can uh, suggest the winning move for black. Go live viewers. You guys can do it. You've been quiet up to now. Now you have to play as good as Carlson to become world champion. Truth hurts. I think all my viewers fell asleep. Nobody say nothing. You guys are all muted. So if you're actually trying to say something, I can't hear you. Is it queen e1? Queen e1 is correct. Very good. And Carlson played queen e1, and that's it. The white's attack is finished. White can never move the knight because it's pinned. And moving the bishop does nothing. And you can't put the rook on h3 because the bishop's on c8. So the only thing white can do 
is play Rook H4. Anand didn't play Rook H4. Anand actually resigned. If he plays Rook H4, you just take it. And then Black's up a Rook, and White can never attack. You can, you can make as many moves in a row you want for White, and there's nothing you can do. You can't break through Black's defenses. And then Black's going to start attacking the C3 pawn and winning, and if White plays some queen move to defend that, then we can start getting our pieces out because queen h6 to g7 isn't a threat. It's also possible that black could play h5 here and stop the queen h6 threat. And if you take, then white's, white's attack is over. Black's up a rook. So after queen e1, you can't play rook h4. What's the difference? Thanks for asking. Difference is, if you play bishop f1, the knight on g3 blocks the queen from going to e1. It, it blocks queen takes h4 because the knight's on g3. Now, now white's winning. So after bishop f1, the game has to continue queen h5, rook a, queen d1, rook h4, queen h5. And the engine says it's about equal, which doesn't make any sense, but you know, engines are engines. Uh, so watching that game live was amazing. And then after knight f1, the game just ended abruptly because knight f1's the worst move that Anand made in the match. He only had two or three legal moves, and he played one that lost immediately, and now his attack doesn't exist anymore, and he's down a rook. But that was the most exciting game of the match, and it's too bad it ended on a blunder. And basically, this match was lost by three blunders in positions that weren't lost near the end of the game. This was at the very end of the game. And I think the players were in bad time trouble, and that could explain why Vichy just missed Queen E1. Uh, the other games were drawn, and the last game, Anand had to win with Black. He was down 6-3. to three. He needed to win the last three games, which nobody thought would happen. Anand played the Sicilian with Black, but he ended up drawing a position that he probably should have lost. And ended up losing the match six and a half, three and a half, and Carlson became world chess champion. So that was exciting when it happened. We were staying up all night watching the games because they were playing in India, which is like, was like 10 and a half or 11 and a half hours different than, than uh, St. Louis, which is where I lived at the time. So very exciting match. Carlson didn't lose any games and became the world champion. And we have a new world champion now, very suspicious. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. I want to thank Anonymous for sponsoring this lecture. Anonymous sponsors a lot of lectures. Thanks, Anonymous. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact my wife, Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com. Keep playing chess, everybody. Thanks for joining and watching the lecture. Please like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and leave a comment. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.